All right, well, good morning. We might kick off. Uh, let me just introduce myself. My name is Malcolm McMillan. I'm the Earthquake Recovery Operations Manager at the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. And who are the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment? Well, we're a central government regulator, and in the context of earthquake recovery, I guess uh, we are regulating the building and construction sector. So we license tradespeople and builders and architects and engineers and we set the standards for building in New Zealand, so we uh, write the building code and, and set those quality standards. Uh, I have a colleague here with me, Patrick Schofield from Christchurch City Council. Um, Patrick works in the building consents area, so he's here to help me with some questions if you have any around building consent issues. And we'll jump into the uh, presentation. So look, briefly today, I just want to talk to you a, a sort of some general stuff around uh, consumer guidance around entering the building process. It's really important that people understand their rights and responsibilities and obligations. For homeowners, um, it's their ultimate obligation to ensure that any building work that they do is done lawfully, that there's the necessary consents under, uh, obtained, and that people uh, build the, to the right standard, in this case the building code. Now most people employ professionals and tradespeople to do that for them uh, and many of you will be working through with project management officers here in Christchurch to help administer repairs and rebuilds, which is all good. There are a number of other parties that it's worth talking to um, who have an interest in your property, such as um, the, the, the mortgage, mortgagee, mortgageur, um, such as your bank or a finance company. If you're a landlord, then tenants that might be living in your property will also be relevant for you to have conversations with. Clearly the council and their building consent authority, the, the department that issues building consents and carries out building inspections, um, EQC if there's some damage that you're having to get fixed, and your insurance company. So it's really important that you just think about who are the various different parties that you need to talk to who have an interest in your property and make sure that they're aware of all the different things that uh, you're going to be doing in terms of a repair or a rebuild. The building codes, and New Zealand has a standard for the quality of building work in New Zealand, and it's the, the, the New Zealand building code. It sets a minimum standard, so people can always do uh, build greater or stronger or better than the, the minimum standard, but nonetheless it sets a minimum standard. And the mechanisms to achieve building code compliance can vary around the country, depending on environmental conditions. For example, big, lots of the South Island have uh, requirements around snow load and we have to have stronger roofs to cope with snow because of the environmental conditions. Um, other parts of the country have geothermal activity and the, the various um, sulphuric gases that come from that, so they have different requirements around corrosion. And then of course Christchurch and Wellington have uh, a new seismic seismicity level, so uh, we have to have um, more resilient buildings to cope with earthquakes. In practice and at an operational level, designers, builders, project management companies are all responsible for ensuring that the building work they design and the building work they carry out complies with the New Zealand Building Code. And they need to have obtained building consents for a lot of the re, re, uh, major repair work and of course all rebuild work in the earthquake recovery, they'll need building consents. Uh, the consents are issued by the local council and then their inspectors come and do inspections during construction and then it's homeowners' obligations at the end of a job to ensure that they apply for a co-compliance certificate. And this is a certificate that the council issues that um, gives you a level of assurance that the work's been carried out properly and that it complies with the approved consent that's been issued by the council. So we want to really encourage people and remind people just to ask for those co-compliance certificates at the end of any building project that's been consented. In, I think it was March last year, we introduced this thing called restricted building work. And basically, government determined that in the, uh, the post-leaky building era, that there were key parts of a building that were really important to make sure they were done right and by skilled and competent tradespeople. And we call these key areas restricted building work, and they are effectively the structure, so any foundation work or um, the framing of the building or the envelope of the building to ensure it's weather tight and doesn't leak. These are areas we call restricted building work. And if they are consented work, then they have to be undertaken by a licensed building practitioner or a licensed tradesman. So that's a, a licensed designer has to have designed the work and a licensed builder has to have undertaken that work or specialist sub-trades as well, such as plasterers or specialist cladding installers, all need to be licensed in this new era. 
And that's really all about ensuring that we get um, the, mo the right skilled, competent people undertaking that work so that we get a quality outcome. So after the Canterbury earthquakes, um, government has set some stronger and more resilient standards for buildings in Christchurch, in Can Greater Christchurch, the Canterbury area, particularly around foundations, but then also around how we brace buildings and uh, how they stay together. And Patrick might hold up the book. This is one of many um, technical guides that the ministry has issued. Uh, this one here, particularly around a lot of the foundation solutions. But we've also issued a lot of guidance around um, how to undertake repairs, common earthquake damage repair solutions, so chimneys and um, parts of outside walls that have fallen in. So the ministry has spent a lot of time developing a lot of technical guidance just to help the local engineers, designers and builders to crack on and get the, uh, the rebuild work and the repair work underway and to meet that, um, that good quality standard. And ultimately to help make sure that our future building stock is as resilient as it possibly can be. Uh, it will come as no surprise to all of you that there are areas of Christchurch that are uh, more prone to liquefaction should we have another uh, significant earthquake, and there are areas that are not. And the Ministry has um, classified properties in Christchurch into technical classifications, and you'll all be familiar with the TC1, 2 and 3 categorisation system. In some of those areas uh, at greater uh, risk or prone to liquefaction, such as technical category three classified properties, we're really encouraging the use of lighter weight clad buildings. The weight of a building uh, is directly relates to the performance of that building. And one of the big learnings from the February 2011 earthquakes was that buildings that had lightweight claddings that didn't weigh as much on the land performed better than those that had heavier weight claddings. We saw a lot of um, brick veneers come down and a lot of concrete tile roofs get sort of tossed around and, 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 and come off their um, rafters. So moving forward, we are sort of unashamedly encouraging people to think about lightweight claddings uh, if you're in those areas that are prone to liquefaction. Uh, there'll be a number of repair jobs uh, to your house that actually replacing the cladding can help uh, to make that building more resilient moving forward. And it may even make the difference between what might have been a rebuild job can then become a repair job if you can change the cladding system. So these are all discussions to have with insurance companies and project management officers uh, and work through those various issues. <coughs> Look, typically a sort of a three bedroom, 150 square metre um, uh, timber weatherboard uh, sort of bungalow, you know, m might might weigh about um, 20 tonnes or thereabouts. Put um, concrete tile roof on it and brick veneer, and you could be up around the 60 tonnes. So it can almost triple the weight of a building by having some of those heavyweight claddings on them, and that's a lot of weight that goes onto the land that uh, needs to su be supported when when there's liquefaction or lateral spread. So in TC3, we're really encouraging people to keep it light with the cladding systems. A couple of years ago the Ministry issued a compliance document called the Simple House Acceptable Solution and this was a guide to help people to design um, modern, contemporary, architecturally designed but affordable homes and we're encouraging people to look at that on our website um, and to consider that if they're in the rebuild situation. Um, it provides a quick easy way of achieving a co-compliant house and design. It helps the council to, um, to review and sign off the building consent because they can have confidence that it complies with the building code. There's a lot of lightweight clad solutions in there as well. So we're encouraging people to think about uh, that as a housing design solution for them. Some other tips. Uh, entering the building process can be quite scary and complicated and it's something that um, homeowners actually do very seldomly in their life uh, and so you know it can be complicated and there's a lot to sort of make sure you get right. One of the first things we'd really encourage people to do is get it in writing um, always have a contract even if you've got a small repair job um, you know have a contract for that work. If you've got a large repair or a rebuild have a contract for that job. If you're going through one of the project management offices or a group housing company doing that work, they'll have standard contracts and, and terms and conditions. Um, if it's a simple repair job, you know, even an email that kind of spells out what you want done and the standards that you want that done to, and an agreed uh, process between you and the builder or the main contractor forms a contract. So we really encourage people to get it in writing. 
Um, in New Zealand, historically, only about a third of all of our building work in the residential space has had contracts in place, and that's made it really difficult if things do go wrong at the end to then resolve those disputes um, because people can sort of argue that they had a different view about what was supposed to be achieved. So have a, get it in writing and have a contract. The, the little guide that's on your seat spells out, uh, there's a section here on contracts, and it spells out all the sort of ingredients that are in a good contract and what you should have in terms of a, a clear description of the actual work, um, contact details, a time frame that you expect things to be finished by, um, a process for varying the, the design or the construction during the project. Inevitably people change their mind, they see stuff on site and they say, oh I want to change that, let's go with a bay window in that kitchen now instead of a greenhouse one. Um, have a process uh, agreed up front about how those changes will happen and then document those changes and make sure that that gets into the contract. Again, so there can be no disputes at the end around what was expected and who was supposed to do what. We encourage people to keep all receipts, invoices and manufacturer's warranty. These are really important documents for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it's a really good traceability in terms of in the years ahead, whether it's yourself as, the, as still the building owner or a future homeowner, if, if something goes wrong you can kind of look at those documents and work out who did the work and you'll be able to go back and maybe hold those people to account. So they're really good from a traceability point of view. And then obviously just manufacturer's warranties and installer's warranties are good in terms of making sure people come, can come back and fix things if uh, you have any defects. I think too for future homeowners, people will sell houses and move on and people will buy houses. Having copies of all those documents will help to provide evidence that you had earthquake damage but you got it repaired and the extent of those repairs. And for future homeowners, that's going to be really important when they buy and sell houses in Canterbury moving forward. You know, was there earthquake damage here? Did you get it repaired? Um, where is the evidence to show me that you did that? So copies of those manufacturer's warranties, receipts and invoices will help to build a paper trail that you did the responsible thing, got those repairs fixed and who did, those, who did that work. And then if you do notice things that are not right, um, you do notice some defects after a repair or a rebuild job, don't delay in terms of raising those with the right people and, um, and, and you know, invoke those warranties as soon as possible. So one of the big issues in Christchurch at the moment is accommodation, particularly for those who are um, displaced from their homes for short or long periods of time. And one of the, um, the excellent services that are available in Christchurch is the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service. And we're really encouraging people to connect up with that service. Um, they have a stand directly at the back here, just outside the seminar area. And there are three functions to that service. Um, they assist homeowners to find temporary accommodation whether that's just to move out of your home while you have a repair job undertaken or while you're waiting for a rebuild of your house, then the people at the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service help to match and place people into temporary accommodation. That's both in the private uh, rental market uh, and also in the temporary villages that the Crown has built. There's also financial assistance. For some people, they will be incurring a double housing cost. They'll be paying a mortgage on a uh, earthquake damaged property and they might have to go and rent somewhere temporarily while that house gets repaired or rebuilt. So there's a double housing cost for them. And once they've exhausted their insurance uh, temporary accommodation supplement, then the, the, the temporary accommodation service can provide financial assistance for those households. It's non-means tested uh, and it's there for people to, um, to tide them over while they get those repairs and rebuilds done. And then the other key and third component of the service is just the Earthquake Support Coordination Service. A whole bunch of dedicated people to help guide people through and navigate their way through all the different um, issues, insurance and planning for the future, accommodation, budgeting, uh, just to help um, connect people up to the right services uh, that may, people may not always be aware of and, and that exist out there. And there's some contact details there in terms of the Temporary Accommodation Service or CTAS for short the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. We've got a website with a wealth of information on it around technical categories, um, foundation solutions, repair solutions to buildings. Um, Christchurch City Council, of course, have got an important role in terms of the whole consenting uh, of all of this. And we've all got stands. The Temporary Accommodation Service has a stand just to the back of us here outside the seminar area. The ministry is next door to that as well, so, so don't be afraid to come up and have um, ask questions of us. And then also the, the council are just further down the aisle here as well. So that's kind of me in terms of the key things. And I'm really available to answer a whole bunch of questions if people have those um, with my colleague uh, Patrick from the council. 
so open to take questions. Um, if people have questions, please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you because we are recording uh, this seminar and so it'll be helpful just to pick up the, the, the voice. Does anyone have any questions? I must have done my job well. <laughs> please, I'll, we'll, grab a, we'll bring a mic. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, you mentioned before about lightweight claddings, you know, uh, replacing uh, repaired buildings, whatever, with, with lightweight cladding and, and uh, preference to uh, concrete or brick or whatever. Um, I'm in the situation where um, I'm dealing with uh, Fletchers and they've and, uh, and EQC, and they've categorically refused to replace a concrete block veneer with weatherboards, as I offered to do so. Uh, they say whatever was there has to go back. Uh, have you got any uh, comment about that? It's a repair job, is it? Uh, sorry, yes it is, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's a tricky one because there can be layers of complexity around um, the EQC Act and um, what it does and doesn't allow to be fixed. So there's some constraints there for Fletchers working under the EQC Act around what has to be repaired and put back the same and things like that. So um, it's hard for me to make too much comment without knowing the specifics of your situation, but I'm happy to talk to you afterwards and, and try to understand that in more detail. But I think fundamentally what's at play there is, a, is some constraints and limitations around um, the EQC legislation that requires things to be sort of put back as they were rather than change and have new cladding systems. But maybe we'll talk, catch up later and we can find out more in detail.